Hello, I'm Sylvia Nagisako, Professor of Anthropology and Co-Director of the Center for Global Ethnography at Stanford University. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Sarah Pink, who is Director of the Emerging Technologies Research Lab at Monash University. In this interview, we talk about Professor Pink's use of video ethnographic methods and a number of other methods she's used to conduct ethnographic research remotely. We're really very interested in knowing how you've used digital tools for ethnographic research. Yes, yeah, so that's been one of the main themes in, in my whole career. And um, I did a master's degree in visual anthropology at the University of Manchester very early on. And that I was already interested in, in the use of photography and video and research, but that really shaped um, the way I developed my ethnographic practice throughout my whole career. Um, and for me, becoming a doc ethnographic doc documentary filmmaker wasn't necessarily my ambition. I wanted to become an anthropologist, um, but I wanted to take the, that learning and to take those ethnographic documentary skills into my, my practice as an ethnographer. And I have had the opportunity to do that across a whole range of projects, particularly since the late 1990s, where I started to develop video ethnography methods um, particularly with people living in their homes, so doing ethnographies of everyday life in the home, but also urban ethnographies, um, ethnographies of, of cycling, of commuting. Um, and so I've, I've developed those methods across the whole range of different kind of research questions and research sites and across various different countries as well. And I think for me, video facilitates so many kind of additional and important elements of a research process. Um, it can be used in long-term traditional ethnographic field work, but it also can be a really profitable and beneficial part of shorter term field work where we have to, by necessity, engage with research participants for a much shorter period of time, which may be related to the time scales of projects, but it might also be related to the amount of time that they can actually give us and the places and the particular sites and contexts in which you're working with us. So I see video as being part of a quite intense encounter. Um, but importantly, I see it as a mode of getting under the surface of everyday life experience, which is very different from conventional participant observation. So for me, when I work with video, I'm not trying to objectively record what's happening in front of the camera. And I've never, never really thought of it that way. Um, I think going back to the ethnographic kind of documentary technique, it's about being in there, you know, with the participants, part of the action and understanding that myself and the camera is actually being part of that, becoming part of the everyday world, which I'm investigating as I work with the camera and as I work with the participants. Can you say something, uh, since you've been doing this video ethnography, what kind of video equipment you've been using? Yes, the, the equipment that I've been using has evolved over the years. Um, so, of course, I learned how to, um, to make ethnographic documentaries using VHS and SVHS video at the end of the 1980s. Um, and, but since then, I think the most interesting evolution in video um, camcorder, camcorders in particular has been the fold-out screen, which came along around the late 1990s, which enabled us to actually have a very different view so you weren't then viewing the research participants through the viewfinder, you were actually viewing them through the fold-out screen, which meant you could still maintain eye contact, and you had a kind of double vision of what you were recording, but also the wider environment in which you were actually recording and, and what was going on around you. I think that for me also go back, goes back to an essential aspect of working with video ethnographically for me, is that you're not just... The video recording should never be thought of as simply what you're observing through the camera lens. It, in a sense, kind of pulls with it that whole embodied experience and the sensorial experience of being in a research encounter. Which is, again, why I say that we, we shouldn't think of video recording as simply being observational. It's actually part of the process of ethnographic sensing and ethnographic note-taking, kind of pulls together that being there in the field. Um, with our experience as ethnographers and the, the way that we can then use those videos to, in a sense, enable us to feel that sense of being in the field again, albeit differently because we would have then moved forward in certain ways. 
have you have you used anything like iPhones? I'm just thinking about things that you know lots of people will have just on hand mm -hmm. in the field that they might not necessarily have special equipment. Have you ever tried some of that? Yes, I have used smartphone, but I would only usually use a smartphone if I didn't have another camera with me. So I haven't intentionally gone out to do smartphone ethnography. Nevertheless, I know that other researchers have smartphones produce excellent images. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very viable um, approach to doing ethnography, especially if you're in situations where you don't want to carry kind of more professional and bigger equipment with you. And obviously, you can also use the iPhone for, for photos and for audio recording and um, and you can e easily share any video clip you make of a research participant with them immediately from an iPhone as well, which I think in terms of kind of creating that confidence and trust and those kinds of modes of sharing with research participants, it's, it's um, yeah, a really, really interesting mode of working. Is there any particular way in which you introduce your video recording or smartphone recording um, to address those uh, issues of trust and um, uh, among your informants, is there a way you would use this after having spent some time with them or how do you usually set that up? Very often in the projects that I do, um, the research participants know that we want to use video before we ever meet them. And um, I would usually, sometimes, um, they're not sure um, because there are always other options. You know, it's not always necessary for us to video record when I work with participants in, in field work. But um, there are various ways that I think you can engender people's trust. And one thing that I've used for a very long time now is a quite um, layered mode of, um, of informed consent. Um, so obviously we go through our university ethical approval procedures, um, which require us to, to gain um, informed consent. But I. For me, it goes beyond that. So um, I ask participants to go through a quite layered process where they, they think about what they would like the video recordings to be um, shown to use, just use within our research team, if they would allow us to show them in presentations, um, if they would allow us to, to, to show them online, um, if they would allow us to use video stills in publications and um, invite them to think about all those, those different possibilities also in relation to their own anonymity if they would otherwise you know, prefer to, to remain anonymous. Um, I also invite them to give me their email addresses so that I can contact them if they would actually like to see any clips and view them before they're, they're used or shown anywhere as well. So, um, so at the very least we use that kind of informed consent form. Um, we also in, in one project in particular actually sent the um, participants' DVDs with all of their video recordings on, invited them to watch them and to alert us to any parts of the video they'd like to have deleted, um, and also invited them to, to view all of the, the uses we made of their videos. And um, I think, obviously, longer-term projects and developing deeper relationships with the participants means that they're, they're likely to kind of understand better the project and, and your motivation. Are there any ways you can think of that one uh, a researcher might actually use, um, you know, video ethnography even if they're not present? You know, we're dealing with this mm -hmm. situation now where we're trying to figure out what particular methods we can use um, yeah. remotely. Um, is that something that you've ever used by actually asking people to set up a, a webcam or turn on their uh, their mm -hmm. you know smartphone? Yeah, I think I'd start, I'd start somewhere else, actually, because I've actually been rem working remotely for um, over seven years now. Um, I moved to Australia in 2012, and I still had ongoing projects, video projects in the UK. So during that time, I worked with um, Kirsten Leader-Mackley, who is a research fellow on one of my projects, um, and she produced video. And we, we shared that video, we analysed it together, and we continued to work together at distance. Um, so within, a, I think what I learned from that kind of project is that as a researcher, when you're engaged in the ethnographic process with a co-researcher, you maybe de designed the project, the project, or you participated in some of the ethnography, it's very easy to feel yourself into the, the video materials that a co-researcher will produce. You know, to the point where sometimes there's one video in particular that I watch, and sometimes I forget that it wasn't me who filmed it because I've watched it so many times, but also because we worked in a very synchronized way. Um, but, but I know really that Kirsten did film it. 
Um, and um, so there's one, so one aspect of this is that video can work very, very well in ethnographic teamwork. And that can mean that you can work all over the world with, with teams of ethnographers um, who are producing materials in different places. Um, but on the other hand, of course, in this particular context that we're in now, then we can't have ethnographers kind of out there even doing the field work ourselves. Now, um, obviously that does present challenges. I think it presents particular challenges for people whose expectations were that that's what they were going to do. But um, in various other projects, there have been specific reasons why we've already, we've asked the participants to produce the videos themselves. So um, one project was actually in Melbourne. It's a project that my colleague Shanti Sumatoyo worked on with me um, here. And we decided to, um, to with them, um, we decided to do a research project looking at um, cycling commuters in Melbourne. And also two of our colleagues also worked on a part of the project with us in Canberra. Um, and because, so again, we were working remotely and sharing materials across our team, but also we realized that we wouldn't be able to cycle with the cycling commuters. Um, you know, some of them were going very fast. <laughs> and, um, and also they had, some of them had really long commutes. Um, so we asked them to wear GoPros um, while they cycled. And there's another reason why we asked them to wear GoPros, because we were also particularly interested in self-tracking. So if they were using um, some of the various um, wristbands and other tracking apps and technologies and apps that and while they were cycling. So we hope that when they stopped to check their, their technologies, the self-tracking technologies would also catch that um, on, on the GoPro. So in this project, we gave them the GoPros, they recorded um, their preparations for cycling, they recorded their whole commute, and they also recorded their arrivals. Um, and then they, they gave the GoPros back, um, and we analyzed the materials, and then also viewed them again with the participants um, to kind of to gain understandings based on, on what we'd viewed and, and what we viewed with them. So that was our kind of our way into the experience of cycle commuting and self-tracking cycle commuting with those participants. And that for us, that was the only way we could actually get into the kind of the sensory and kind of effective worlds in which they, they cycled. Um, now we did do some of that work face to face, but we, we didn't necessarily need to. We could very well have just had the GoPros delivered and then had them sent back and then done a, a screen sharing um, post, um, um, recording interview with them and, and then recorded that online as well. Similarly, um, I've been a couple of years ago, I was involved in two projects in Brazil, working with colleagues at the um, Federal University of Pernambuco and Samsung, Samsung Institute. And there we also did some research about um, people's everyday morning routines in their homes and also their commutes. And again, in that project, um, Many of the participants self-documented those experiences because it was very impractical for the researchers to travel with them. Sometimes it was just inappropriate and maybe wouldn't have been safe. Um, and some of the commutes across big Brazilian mega cities, you know, were at least two hours. Um, so it was really impractical for the researcher to travel over to the, the participants' place as well. So um, um, that enabled us to kind of to record with the participant the whole journey of you know people were when people danced in their car when they communicated with others when they were driving um but and and then to again be able to interview them um, about those videos so again another example of project that could perfectly well be developed online well that's fascinating i i i uh, really appreciate the combination of participant observation you're able to do remotely but also yeah. to interview people about their experience after that. So that, that mm -hmm. seems like a really um, useful combination. Yeah. Can you say something about how the particular methods um, that you've used either remotely or the, the video recordings have shaped the kind of research questions you have been able to ask and the findings that you are, have arrived at? Yes, I think um, well, when I when I design an ethnographic project, then I'd always have a set of research questions, um, which will be contingent perhaps on if I'm working with an external research partner, quite a few of my projects are connected with industry partners, um, or with academics from other disciplines. So we often have kind of shared questions that you might not usually ask um, as a kind of more classical anthropologist. 
Um, but we also have those um, research findings or questions that emerge during the process. And I, I've recently started to um, refer to what I call the ethnographic hunch, um, which is a research finding that emerges um, maybe in your first two encounters with the participants in the research. And, and then you follow that hunch through the whole project. And I guess most anthropologists who've done field work will know exactly what I'm talking about because um, but I found it useful to call it something to actually put a name on that process because I think we're often so um, our, our modes of our methods of analysis and interpretation are often seen as kind of so mysterious and um, and difficult for other people from other disciplines to kind of to understand and to know where our ideas and our, our kind of concepts come from so for me it's always a mix kind of bringing together the question of what we thought we wanted to know and, and what we really can know through research. So thinking about the current situation and uh, you know, we have quite a few graduate students who are just starting to embark on their mm. research projects and faced um, with a at least immediate future in which they're gonna have to be figuring out how to do some of this remotely and using digital methods. Do you have any suggestions for ways in which they might start to approach uh, the, their projects using digital methods, um, especially for those who are not necessarily going to be focused on media-centric research. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that um, research, your research yeah, doesn't have to be focused on questions around technology and media for us to be able to use technology and, and media to be able to do our field work. Um, Although I guess that in the current context, I think we just always need to be super attentive um, to the roles that media are playing in our lives, um, but without making those media centric projects. And I guess I would also say that most of my media focused research has been non media centric and that has been at the core actually of, of my message, um, I think for any any PhD student who's um, doing a research project that is about media, if you try to decenter the media, then you probably find out what you really need to find out. I'll mention a couple of projects that I'm involved in. Um, well, we've actually had to confront some of those issues already. So one project um, is a project that we're developing in Sweden. And the project started a while ago. We um, were planning to do face-to-face -face ethnography. And that project, I was planning to do face-to-face -face ethnography in Sweden. Obviously, I haven't been able to leave Australia. Um, the project's called Design Ethnographic Living Labs for Future Urban Mobility. And um, it's funded by an organisation called Drive Sweden. Um, for that project, then, um, our ethnographic team, and I should give particular credit to the, um, the, the research fellows who, who are involved in that work in Sweden. Um, so they, they couldn't get out there to, to do the interviews. So they've developed um, a really interesting um, ethnographic research pack which um, they've sent out to the participants and have tested and now well, with some interviews. And, and it contains you know, various kind of instructions for activities and a diary that they ask the participants to keep. And they've also managed to produce excellent um, interviews using um, the Microsoft Teams platform. Um, so there are many platforms that we can use, you know, be it Zoom, which everybody seems to be using for online teaching at the moment, or the, the platform that, that kind of best suits you and the work you kind of, you, you want to do. Um, so that's one example of a project that's really, you know, just adapted to, to online for the moment, but with the idea that we hope to be able to do face-to-face -face, um, interviews later. Um, Another project um, we were actually had already started and very luckily we had done video ethnography field work with um, a, about um, 10, 15 participants in their homes already. And um, this project is called Intelligent Home Solutions for Independent Living. And we're working there with um, a not-for-profit um, organization called McLean Care. And it's a Department of Health funded project that seeks to understand how older people are using smart home how they engage with smart home technologies in their home. So for us, it's quite an exciting project because it's it's quite it's very experimental for us as, as well for me as an anthropologist, and that the technologies have been installed in smart home technologies have been installed in the older people's homes, and um, we're interested in how they engage with them, um, but really kind of looking at that deeply and ethnographically. Um, to see how they kind of appropriate them into their lives, how they might play with them, um, and how they can actually make them become part of their worlds and, and meaningful to them, or not. 
Um, so in that project, we did video ethnography with the people in their homes. Um, so we were able to film them using the technology, showing us around their homes, um, and, and to really kind of get that in-depth sensorial and kind of intimate kind of series of conversations and performances of how people do things with technology. I mean, the performative aspect of um, video ethnography is very important for me. And then suddenly, you know, the COVID-19 crisis um, began and, and we realized that um, because we're dealing, you know, with an older age group, we won't be able to go back and do field work with them at all during the, the um, period of our, um, our project. So we've had to find other ways to continue to the work. Um, but fortunately, because we've already got the videos, but I think this would hold for any, any videos, even if the participants had, had produced the videos, because we've got the videos, then we actually know what their homes look like. So my colleague who did the, the first round of follow up interviews was actually able to talk to their participants about their homes and what they were doing in them and how they felt with that visual and kind of spatial and sensory understanding of, of what it was like to be there. Um, and, and as we move on in that project, then we'll try to use FaceTime and other video conferencing techniques if we can, depending very much on the participants and what they're interested in and able and willing to, to use. Um, so those are two projects. And the final project is a, is a brand new project that um, I'm involved in. And this is an ESRC, Economic and Social Research Council kind of project in the UK. And i um, working on that project with Harry Ferguson, who's a professor of social work. And this project is called Social Work and Social Distancing. And it's, the subtitle is Learning from the Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Child Protection Service Users and the Capacity to Keep Children Safe, which is a long title, but it expresses what the project is about. And um, so both of us, um, both co-investigators, have been incredibly interested in the sensorial experience of home, the sensory home. and. Um, and particularly in, in the context of social work research, Harry's work had focused, and it was a work I'd always really admired actually, had focused on the, the sensorial kind of ways of knowing that social workers kind of engage in as they go into the um, service users' homes and, and the being there and the whole kind of emotional sensory experience and how that works as part of social work. Um, but obviously once the pandemic started then, um, people who care for other people in, in their homes, um, people who, who go into other homes and other kind of modes of work, um, their, their work practices have had to shift dramatically um, because they actually haven't been able to do home visits. So, um, so we, we learned that social workers had actually started to use video conferencing um, or other kind of apps um, to be able to contact service users in their homes, but they hadn't actually been able to do those sensory visits. So then that presented a big question of how is that actually impacting on their practice and, and on their ability for, to, to keep children safe. Um, and also, as they were working from home undertaking these, these roles, also what difficulties were they encountering in terms of having to shift their workspace into their own homes? So that's a project that we're actually having to do completely online at the moment. Um, so we're doing online research with people who themselves have had to start working online as well. So in that project where we're now kind of working out the different ways that we can use different platforms and different camera and, and video technologies um, with those participants in order to be able to kind of gain those deep sensory understandings of their experiences and, and, and a sense of how their work practices are shifting and changing and what the impact of that is. So, I mean, so that was a fantastic opportunity, really, to design a project that was going to be, that was a product um, of the pandemic and that would actually need to engage with the context of the pandemic as, as its fieldwork sites on those multiple levels. That's really very useful. These examples, the specific examples that you've given us are really um have great information in there. And I'm sure that this is going to generate a lot of questions that uh, graduate students and others will want to ask you during the live question and answer uh, event mm -hmm. that we're going to be having soon. So thank you so much for this. Could I just add and one other thing about video, which is that um, you should never think of, and especially I think when we're working in these online contexts and creating kind of online research environments, we should never think of the video as something that's given to us and that then we take away. We should always think of that as a shared material with our research participants and then even more so in this kind of context of working online and to, main, to use maybe the video as the core, but then to continue that 
conversation and that dynamic using whichever kind of social media platforms and modes of connection um, that can keep us connected. That's really, really useful. I really like the idea. I, I, I've been talking to some students about um, the ways in which um, the particular situation we're in now presents some interesting opportunities to actually have more intimate um, participant observation with some of our, um, you know, the people we study than we might have otherwise, because I, I think that there are some people who will let you into their home through video or through a smartphone that you might not otherwise have been able to have access to otherwise. Yes, and I, I agree that, you know, video um, before that for me also always created a very intimate kind of research encounter. Um, and it's also an encounter in which the research participants very often um, will show me things because they can, because they know what video is for. So the, the encounter always becomes, I think, more performative than it would do if it's simply a face-to-face -face chat. Maybe face-to-face, -face, you're performative in different ways. But um, I think that performative dimension is really important and recording those types of performances and, and the places in their homes that, that people will take you, the things that they will show you, um, is a really kind of also fascinating exploration of the, the materiality of home and, and the meaning of home and the, the feelings that are associated with different aspects of home.